All too often, when you or I want to record electric guitar or electric bass into GarageBand, do we automatically go to the amp simulators? Now, yeah, sure, that's a fine way to go, and I've done it a lot. However, in the last, I don't know, year, year and a half, I have been having great success with going direct into my interface. And I think there is no shortage of music out there that will prove to you that this is a good method. I mean, the Beatles did it all the time, so that should be enough, right? So anyway, there is a lot of great tone that can come out of a direct signal going directly into your interface with your instrument. And that's what we are going to discuss. And I'm going to show you how to get the most out of GarageBand using the advanced GarageBand plugins that come for free automatically in GarageBand. No third party plugins in this video at all. Uh, so let's get right to it, okay? Let's go. So this is a little demo that I have recorded simply for this purpose of the demo, okay? Uh, in full disclosure mode, the drums, when I said no third party stuff, ah, it's kind of a lie. Easy Drummer, those are doing my drums. Um, I love Easy Drummer drums. If you're trying to augment your auto drummer in GarageBand, buy the Easy Drummer presets. Uh, they are awesome. Anyway. This is what we're listening for, is the bass and the guitar, which is right here. What I want you to listen for is the warmness, roundness, and evenness of the bass tone. Then on the electric guitar, what I want you to hear is the amount of breath in the tone and the truly sparkly wonderfulness of my Telecaster, which doesn't even have that fresh of strings on it. Anyway, let's listen. Here we go. Okay, so that's it, right? So let's get right to it. Let's look at the bass guitar. There are some things I think you're gonna really enjoy learning in this video. There are some very powerful hidden features in some of these plugins that I'm using. Um, but anyway, the first one that I am gonna use, now you probably already are looking at this like, hey, what's up? You said no simulators and you have bass amp right here. Well, I'm not really using any of the amp simulators. What I am using though is the direct box. So I have this fader right here uh, going all the way to the direct box, okay? So yeah, this is the simulated direct box. It's a nice way to simply warm up your tone, especially for bass. This can be optional. I do enjoy using it because I do think it helps round out the tone in general. Um, so let's listen to this bass tone soloed. Actually, let's turn everything off just so you can hear the direct sound, okay? It's, it's really not bad, even in the whole mix. Yep, so it, it's nice and it's even and you can hear it, but I wanted it to be a little bit warmer, right? It's a bass tone. So I like this little direct box simulator that they have here. Uh, this is the only thing that I'm using in the amp, the bass amp simulation side is just this direct box. Fair warning, when you turn this thing on, make sure that you turn it down before you uh, go full direct box. A lot of times when you do this, it'll just sort of be way too loud. So turn it down before you go hard direct box on this fader, okay? These tone controls here, uh, you know, basically from one to six, it's starting from a lower, more bass heavy sound. And as you turn the tone knob up towards six, you get more mids and a little bit more highs out of it. Uh, the high filter cut is turned off because I didn't really want it. Um, I didn't want to get rid of anything uh, EQ wise with this. I'm really getting away from subtractive EQing in general. Um, of course, when there are honky tones, you know, if I didn't record something right, I will bring it out in EQ, but in general, I'm trying to do more um, adding instead of subtracting when it comes to EQ, okay? So the boost is turned up to here, uh, which is, you know, they don't give you any actual increments, but it's, you know, we'll call that two o'clock. 
So uh, this is going to be dependent on your tone, your your bass, your desire, uh, whatever you're going for. But this is where a lot of the low end is coming from uh, out of this direct box. Okay. So we'll turn that guy back on. And just so you can hear it, we'll go on and off with this in solo mode. Right? So it's nice and nice and subtle. It's very subtle, but it is just sort of rounding out the low end there. Okay, now the next thing, which I thought was sort of fascinating when I found this particular thing, this is in a reverb. Don't ask me why, I couldn't tell you. But this is the Space Designer reverb, which is in your regular old reverb plugins right here. Uh, Space Designer, boom, right there, right? So what I wanna show you though, is if we turn this on and we go here, and we go all the way here to warped effects, go to analog circuits, and you're looking for clean console. Now, this has no reverb on it. This, to my ears, and what I have figured out just by working with it, it really does sound like, you know, just the addition of the input on a console, right? On an actual mixing desk. It's yet another thing that adds a little bit of warmth. It's really good for. Uh, anything you're just trying to add a little bit of analog <laughs> analog warmth to right so uh let's do the same thing on and off with this while we're listening well, there might be too much of a gain increase there so let's turn that down Do you hear it? It's just another little, maybe one, two percent more of a sort of a low mids lift, maybe around 200. So a uh, really nice, easy way to get a, a, an authentic console tone out of GarageBand. For some bizarre reason, it is buried in the space designer reverb. Don't ask me why, okay? Uh, so the next thing in my chain, I obviously we're gonna need a compressor. So what I want you to start thinking about though at this point in this video is the signal path that I'm creating here, right? So I have the direct box first going into a virtual console, right? And now I'm adding a compressor, okay? So I love the multiband compressor out of the AU plugins in GarageBand. Um, just so you know, you go down here, go to audio units, go to Apple, and go to AU multiband compressor. I automatically just go to the analog setting, which is part of this guy right here. There are only four presets. The analog one is the one that I'm using, okay? So if we open up the details on here, we can get all the good stuff that we need, right? You have a pre-gain, a post-gain, attack time, release time, and then uh, EQ volumes. Now, what you should be seeing is I'm actually not doing anything on these at all. I'm really only manipulating the curve of the output and input on this compressor and the manipulation, the threshold more or less, right? So let's listen to this guy. So with this, and it's because of the way that I play, I have worked very hard uh, when I play bass. I really, really try to make sure that my attack from my hands is as even as I can make it um, so that I don't have to work a compressor too hard. Sometimes I like heavily compressed bass tones. Sometimes I don't. In a song like this, you know, a little like sort of easy listening thing, I don't want anything to be too heavily compressed. 
this is going to be dependent on your song, your playing style. But just keep that in mind when you are playing the bass or, or the guitar. Um, try not to be totally dynamic, you know, it, it, from verse to chorus, of course. But through a section, you really want to make sure that you are playing evenly from note to note. Certain strings require more or less attack out of your hand. So that's a playing technique thing that I've really honed in on over the last few years. And it really, really makes a huge difference. So, you know, like we always say, everybody talks about the performance being the most important part. This is a really good example of that, right? Just make sure that your performance is clean and tight. Um, and then you will have to do less processing inside a garage band. You get a better performance and a better tone. Uh, just make sure that you try to play evenly, okay? So anyway, point of this compressor though is just to shave off the little tops, right? So if you see the redness in here is when it's actually starting to work. And we'll just play this again so you can see that. It's just cutting off the little bit of the top. Right? So it's not doing a ton. I mean, you can see the band coming down a bit around here. Uh, band 200. Oh, one other thing that I did do is actually move this particular uh, slider, I guess we would call it, to the left. And I just brought it down to 100 hertz um, because that's where I put it. And I think that's a nice general area for this compressor to be working. Okay. The other thing I did do was I slowed the attack time up a little bit and I definitely slowed the release time. Again, this is going to be dependent on the song, but just be aware that this is by far the best compressor in GarageBand. Hey guys, I'm sitting here editing the video and realized I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, well, one of the best parts about this multi-band compressor is that this is essentially four compressors in one, right? So the one that you just were watching is this. Uh, band one, which is going from 12 hertz to around 100, right? So band two, which we, you could consider compressor two, is uh, going from that 100 hertz up to 800 hertz, right? Band three and band four. So if I push play on here, and uh, this will be with the bass soloed, uh, watch, I can actually control this threshold right here. Uh, I love that I'm doing this handheld. I can do this uh, on each one of them, right? So as I push play, right? So I could affect this if I wanted to. Here's band three and here's band four and back to band one, right? So again, this is like four compressors in one, this multi-band compressor. It is really, really powerful and you should all be using it a lot. All right, back to your regular program now. That is that part. Now, of course, we're gonna need a little bit of EQ, and that is right here. Like I said before, I'm doing no subtractive EQing in general, except I do, of course, have the high pass filter, just because this particular bass that I was using, my GNL L1000, um, in the pickup setting that I was using, has a lot of low end. It's great for live work, but not so awesome for recording, but that's the position that I like for recording, because it's the warmest tone on that bass. So anyway, here's the EQ. Let's listen to it. Right? So what you should be hearing out of that is how it's just sort of reinforcing all that low end that I have you know, added before with the DI box, with the console input, and then just rounding out everything after the compressor, okay? So that's the bass tone, and all things played together, this is what it sounds like. I love it. I personally love this bass tone. Um, this is, it. like I said, it's warm, it's even, and it's dead clean. There is no like simulated, you know, uh, like when they simulate the cabinets and the amplifiers and the microphones and all those things, one of the things they're simulating is some of the negative stuff of those, right? 
So it's not always ideal to put a microphone in front of a bass amp. Sometimes you want a direct sound. If you really like like good, clean, dry tones, this is the method for you. Um, this by far is, I mean, if you're trying to get just good, solid, clean, dry tones, ah, so great for bass, okay? So let's go down to the guitar here. This is the Telecaster. And you'll see here, I'm using a lot of the same things. The only thing that's uh, different is actually I'm using the AU Matrix Reverb and we will get to that. Okay, so first thing in line is the Space Designer with the clean console setting in. You know, look, the dry output is totally set to mute, right? So there is no dry output. This is all the reverb output. I don't, again, just don't know why they call it that. Um, there is no reverb on this particular plugin. If I turn my reverb off, solo this channel, you'll hear totally dry. Let's turn it all off just so you can hear the dry tone. I mean, here, listen to that. That's I love that tone. It's good, clean electric guitar tone. All by itself, right? That lovely, lovely high end on my electric guitar comes out. Now, it might be a little bit too much. It does sound very, very dry, right? I get it. But anyway, let's turn the clean console on. This is what it sounds like. Warms it up. Hear that? Immediately. Hear that? It's so good. Again, we might have a little bit too much gain increase on that. Okay, so what you should be hearing, at least what I'm hearing, um, it's just sort of cleaning off some of that extra crispiness on the top end and uh, warming up a little bit of the low end. I mean, gosh, how awesome is that? Just by this one thing. Right, turn it off. Turn it back on. Ah, it's so awesome, you guys. So again, this is in that Space Designer reverb that is a stock plugin in GarageBand. Uh, just go down to clean console under the warped effects sound uh, in analog circuits, right? This is obviously a simulated analog circuit, but uh, you do what you can inside of GarageBand, okay? Um, also, in this analog circuits thing, there's a lot of fun things. Look, I mean, vintage fuzz pedal. There's all sorts of interesting things to uh, look at here. These are some of the hidden features that uh, nobody could explain to me why they are here, so I can't tell you why, but they are hidden features in GarageBand in a reverb that are super, super fun. I mean, tape saturator, all such a great things in here. Anyway, we're looking at clean console. I did totally geek out and play with all of them and they're really fun. Okay, so I have the clean console on. Next up, of course, I'm gonna use this multi-band compressor. I have it set to gentle and uh, let's go down to the details and we will look again. EQs are all set to zero. Uh, release time is, you know, sort of fast and attack time is kind of slow. So uh, let's listen to this on and off. Right? I mean, keeping in mind that this dot right here is the threshold point, okay? So everything, anytime you see it go above that, even though you might not see that red uh, indicator, uh, it, it, it is, you know, above the threshold, it is compressing it a tiny, tiny bit. You can see the arrow turning red, okay? Uh, so this, again, is gonna be very dependent on your performance and all that kind of stuff. But again, multiband compressor, by far the most powerful compressor in GarageBand. You have a pre-gain and a post-gain control. You have attack and release times, and you have an EQ, uh, at least the, the volume of the EQs in here. Uh, this is a great compressor, and it, it sounds good, and this is pretty much the only compressor you should be using in GarageBand if you ask me. It's not the easiest, but it is the most powerful and it is the one that gives you 
the most amount of information. So when you do make a jump to Logic or Pro Tools, you will actually be familiar with some of these controls, right? I don't expect any of you to like live on GarageBand for the rest of your life. I, I hope that you get to a point where you find its limitations and you're like, hey, I can't do what I want to do inside a GarageBand. Um, but there are things like this that will make that transition easier. Last thing, or second to last thing, is the EQ. Again, I'm not doing any subtractive EQ except for top end and low end, but you know the bulk of this tone is not in these areas. This is just to make sure I'm not getting too much of either of those things. Um, let's go back to the top. Right. So, I, you know, I'm trying to bring a little bit more of the high end back out. I am boosting a little bit around 500, which is a great area, especially for a Telecaster. Um, it's just that that low mids area and it's um, just adding a little bit of warmth, just a little, little tiny bit. We don't want this to be heavy, but we don't want it to be um, devoid of low end. Right. So anyway, that is the EQ. Super easy. Um, I did start with the picked electric guitar preset and then uh, went around and tweaked it a little bit as I saw fit. Didn't change the Q factors of any of these. I like using the presets for that purpose. Using them, you know, the Qs are already set to where GarageBand engineers think that should be, and, and they're typically pretty spot on. Okay, so last thing up on this particular one is the AU Reverb, which is right here. And uh, this is, it's the Matrix Reverb. Uh, I wish I had a good, like... Matrixy thing, matrix joke. Anyway, Apple, uh, so audio units, Apple AU matrix reverb right there. All right, okay. So um, let's look at this thing because this reverb is so good. Uh, I, I Maybe you've looked at this before and we're like, oh my gosh, how does this, is, there's just too much, right? There's a lot of stuff to look at here. So here's what it sounds like. I love it. I love, love, love this reverb. Um, okay, so I did go ahead and set it to medium hall too, just to get a couple of presets uh, wrapped up, you know, like already some of the hard work is done. So you have a dry and wet mix. That's pretty self-explanatory. So what this reverb actually does is run two reverbs at a time in one plugin. That's what I love about this, okay? So, and then you can blend the small and large mix between the two of them, okay? Super easy. Pre-delay, if you don't know, that just makes the delay the reverb happen a second later, or in this case, 0 0.0149 seconds, um, a little bit later than the actual attack of the guitar. It gives a little bit of depth. It's not really a delay. It's not something you hear a ton of, but it is something that adds just a little bit of extra space in the tone. Very nice thing to have. Now, modulation rate is very interesting. Um, depth and rate. So these are the things in this particular reverb, and this is on the global controls, right? So this is a modulation of the reverb. If you could think of this as sort of a widening effect, right? Um, let me play it and work with this a little bit, and I'll show you what I mean. So let's just let's just zero it all out. Okay, now if I turn it all the way up, and especially if you're wearing headphones, check out what it does on the right side. I'm wearing my headphones, right? Correct? <laughs> Actually, we should add a little depth to that. hear it so it's it's almost like a chorusy effect it's not a chorus um it's just a modulation of that reverb tone and it does help sort of spread it out a little bit but i don't want you to think of it as like a spreading effect it just helps spill the reverb in a modulated way and you can control the rate that it's modulating right because this is sort of like a warbly thing, um, it never gets very fast you don't hear it going wah, 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 or anything right um, but the depth you know 
So anyway, I like to have it sort of deep and the modulation rate kind of slow. So it's not like two chorus effect, right? Okay, so this is all again going to be, like I said a million times already, dependent on your song and your performance and all these things. So the, the size, the small density, high, you know, these are all pretty self-explanatory, this stuff inside of the small room and large room. Now, I do want to say, though, this is the only reverb that you can actually EQ inside a garage band, which is totally sweet. So what you're looking here is it's a single band, right? So we can go up to, you know, 22,000 hertz and down to 10 hertz, right? So this is if you're thinking about a, a single EQ on the regular EQ, you just get one band of EQ that you're going to poke. Uh, uh, you're going to either bring up or bring down. Okay. So this is the frequency. Uh, this is going to be a lot of high end. Um, this is really mostly high end. And that's awesome because that's where mostly I like to remove um, any of the EQ on a reverb. I, I tend to like darker reverb sounds. That's me personally. Filter bandwidth. This is the Q, right? So this is how wide that uh, this frequency that you're using, how big the bell curve is. And then you have filter gain. So this is it going up or down, right? So uh, this is so awesome that you can actually EQ a reverb inside a garage band. And um, again, going to be dependent on your performance and song and guitar and all these things. But so you're going to have to work with this guy a little bit to find what sounds good. But let me just show you. Right. So th this is me turning up like at. 2509 hertz a lot a lot of high end and this is just the eq of the reverb not the guitar itself but like i said i like darkening uh these things around i like sort of darkening it's three and a half db negative let's listen to that It's awesome. It's awesome. Just darken that reverb up. That's my advice on this. Um, bright reverbs are, you know, maybe good on drums sometimes, but not on guitar tracks too much. I think there's enough high end from the direct tone that I don't need it being like accentuated by the reverb, especially when things like rides or crashes come in. That's an area that you want to typically sort of leave for the rides and the crash, right? Um, okay, so let's listen to the whole thing all together. It's, I, I personally really, really enjoy those tones, and I hope you guys do too. Very last thing, like I'm, I'm trying to throw, just so you guys know, I'm trying to throw the gems, like some little extra gem stuff in the, the end of my videos. So I want to throw one in right here for you now. I don't know if you noticed, but I have these icons here. So one's a Telecaster and one is a bass. If you don't know how to change these icons, I have never spoken about this on my channel. Take your finger here. Hit the control button on your keyboard and then click on there. Oh my gosh, look at all that. So you actually get all these different things that you can choose for, you know, whatever icon you want, the, the amps or whatever. But that's it. Hit the control button. Here, we'll go do it on guitars. Hit, hit the control button on your keyboard. Click on that with your mouse and look at all these guitars. For some reason, there's a sitar under the guitar. Uh, <laughs> but that's that. So anyway, there's your little end of the video gem. And uh, I will, uh, you know, let's let's close it out. We are so overly dependent on amp simulators in general, I think, in the digital recording world. Yeah, they're great. There are some phenomenally good ones. However, these clean, direct sounds going straight into your interface, making sure you get the right signal strength when you record it. Um, Man, it's a totally viable tone. Like I said, the Beatles have used it for, you know, the Beatles use it a lot, a lot, a lot. And, um, you know, so many countless producers and artists 
do it as well. So I just wanted to share that little bit of knowledge with you guys today. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you got something out of this video because that's the whole goal of what I'm doing here, right? So you guys, I haven't said it in a long time, but if you get to this point in the video, hit that subscribe button. I'm getting really close to 100,000 subscribers and I am desperate to get there. So please hit the subscribe button if you're at this point in the video and um, you're the best. All right, have an awesome weekend. I'll see you next weekend. Uh, peace and love. <laughs>